Good morning, all. My name is Reverend Isabel Call, and I'm joining you from Central Ohio, land of the Wyandot, the Hopewell, the Adena. And I am a member of the UWF board and very pleased to be lighting our chalice. We honor this flame as we kindle our own choice to be here now, burning away all the other choices we might have made about where and how to spend our precious time, opening to this mysterious dance of energy among women and allies. We approach the fire with intention, burning what no longer serves ourselves, each other, and humanity, or never did, lingering long enough to let go of what needs to burn, but protecting ourselves uh, and each other from being burned and burned out, even as we stay close enough to be warmed by the truth of change. The fuel for this flame comes from diverse life experiences. Through our choice to burn that fuel, we join in the warmth of community, the light of clarity. Our flame of choice is strong enough to transform systems, humble enough to live gently on a table at the center of a small group of women hearing each other's truths. We light our chalice with anger with commitment, with hope, and with trust in choice and transformation. Thank you so much for that beautiful chalice lighting ceremony, Isabel. My name is Liz Green. I am your host for today, and it's my job to make everything go smoothly. So there's a few things that we want to take care of right away this morning. First, welcome. We're very excited to have you here. Thank you for participating in the chat already. It's really exciting to see how many people are here and from all across the country. When we planned this event, we were hoping for maybe 200 people to join us. There are 328 registered, which is pretty darned exciting. You can part participate with us in a number of different ways. Down at the bottom of your screen, or if you're on the tablet, maybe it's on the side under your more button, there are reactions that you can share. If somebody says something you really love, like right now, why don't we all give Isabel a little love for that beautiful chalice lighting. Put that in there. If you're one of the people that got a breakfast box, you could hold up your thumb, uh, thumbs up sign, which is also going in my garden when we're done. Or if you want to, you could in the chat, put a number of exclamation points. I'm doing that right now. That's a way of showing applause in the chat. So there's lots of ways to participate, but let's talk about this. For about a hundred of you, the first registrants, you received the breakfast box, which is really very cool. This was included, it's a little sign that um, was made just for us. It has the thumbs up on one side, has a, a lovely saying about seeds on this side, and there were some seeds to plant. And you may wonder what, what are you gonna do with this? Um, Worry not, you're going to receive an email after the event and it's going to have lots of things in it, including what do you do with those seeds? So let's talk about what else was in there. Uh, there were the buttons that allow you to let people know what pronouns you prefer. And isn't it cool that there's a lot of them so you can share with your friends? There's also a little <laughs> breakfast in there that we're all going to be able to enjoy. Oh, that's my yogurt. Um, but there's granola and nuts and yogurt to enjoy. Isabel already showed you the beautiful candle that was there. And my favorite, egg soap. Because who doesn't need 
an egg soap for a breakfast meeting. And even better on the back, it says soap for extra, extra, extra ordinary women. This was made just for UWF. This was just made specially for us. And this was just made specially for us. All of them by women owned businesses. And we'll be putting links to hit all of those. So if, even if you didn't get a breakfast box, you could order yourself except for the egg. Evidently, we broke the mold on this one. So if you want it, you're, you're gonna have to ask her. Maybe it will, uh, she'll make that for you, get a new mold. All right, so that's what you need to know about that. As I said, any link that we pop into the chat, you're gonna get in an email. This is being recorded. So if you have to take a little break for some reason, don't worry, you can go back to the recording and catch up or for some reason you got bounced out or if you're watching this recorded, welcome. Thank you for coming back and doing that. We're gonna be doing some breakouts to talk about the different elements of the new mission. So we'll be doing that a little later. Oh, that is everything I have in the housekeeping. And right now, it is my pleasure to introduce to you the president of the UUF board, Claire Sexton. Oop, and I'm finding her. She disappeared. Oh no. Hang on just a moment. I will find her. Claire, can you talk, start talking? Just say hello. Claire, you're muted. Hi, how about that? Better. Hi, welcome. So I'm Claire, the president of the board of the Unitarian Universalist Women's Federation. Uh, coming to you from Waco, Texas, which is also known as the former land of the Comanche and the Huaco Indians. Um, let's see. So we're, I can't believe how many of you there are. So happy you could join us. And thanks for coming before the official beginning of our big conference. Though, of course, it's great to meet in person. Using this format last year allowed many more people to attend. As you can see, this is probably over 100 more than even last year than can fit in the usual banquet room. And we were able to hear from some really inspirational women, including the late Liz Fisher, while we still had her. Our board and staff are such a great team, and I wouldn't still be here as a UU leader without their support and unique strengths. Dana Cater-Robb is our administrator and marketer extraordinaire, who's in Milwaukee. Um, our most newly ordained minister is Reverend Isabel Call. Thank you, Marisol. Um, and Isabel, you saw Isabel, and she's part of the ministry team at First UU Columbus. Uh, Reverend Terry Cummings will soon start her term at the Unitarian Society of Hartford, Connecticut, as their interim minister. Uh, Reverend Kimberly Quinn Johnson serves as the at the UU Congregation of the South Fork in Bridgehampton, New York. And one more minister, the Reverend Nancy Reed McKee. Our West Coast pal serves as minister for the North Lake UU Congregation in Kirkland, Washington. And finally, our interim executive director, Ann Wiesner, who hails from the Minneapolis area. She joined us in November and has skillfully been guiding us through this year's changes. When working with Anne, I often think to myself, yes, this is why we needed somebody to help, and this is why we chose her. In past years, you may have heard me say there's been lots of change, or it's been a year, which may be a Southern thing. I'm from Texas originally. Uh, this year, we took much more concrete steps toward the change we've sought for the organization. I joined the board in 2016, in part to ensure UUWF was grappling with their legacy of white supremacy. I was happy to learn that no convincing was necessary among my colleagues and the work toward anti-racism was going well, if slowly. Such is the nature of such a historical institution. UUWF existed since the U and U merger 
and the journeys of the preceding Unitarian and Universalist women's groups both began back in the 19th century. Our new mission is a thread that will run throughout the breakfast, and I'm taking my opportunity to say it to you myself. The Unitarian Universalist Women's Federation builds covenantal relationships among Unitarian Universalist women that equip us all to be better co-conspirators and allies in the movement for collective liberation. With our longtime program, the Clara Barton Sisterhood, as an inspiration, we are so excited to introduce a new program to recognize our young leaders. We are just starting out with what we're calling um, happily and with the blessing of Elandria's family, the Elandria Williams Leadership Circle. And my friend's name and memory as a way for women's groups, congregations, and individuals to honor women and femme identi and ugh, identifying folks who are 35 and under. In the spirit of Elandria, we are looking to connect fierce young leaders who are working in the fight against the imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy. Our intention with this circle is to create a cohort of folks who can get, who can be and get better at kicking ass and working for justice together. To lend power, to lend our power, to amplify the voices and actions of people who need to be heard. The UUWF will also bring them together at every opportunity so that they can share with and learn from each other and so that we can continue to learn from these young leaders of our faith. I met Elandria at a young adult conference back in 2003, and I can say without a doubt that I have never been the same. I'm so excited to meet more people who have already charged toward justice in their younger years and to do my part to ensure they will also bring our denomination along with them. My friends, allies, and co-conspirators, let us actively conspire to achieve collective liberation. And it is my pleasure to introduce for our first conversation about that new mission, Reverend Kimberly Quinn Johnson. Uh, good morning. It's still morning wherever most of us are. I'm the Reverend Kimberly Quinn Johnson. I think I'm talking slowly so that the cameras can find me. There we are. So I'm talking about covenantal relationships and why that's a part of our mission and why and how. We hope it's something that you all will think about and take up also. In reimagining our mission, what are we here for and who are we here for? We started from a place of covenant. Covenant is essential to our shared faith, but even if it weren't, it's a good place to start with relationship. But what does that mean to be in covenantal relationship? The simplest way that I describe that for people is that a covenant is a sacred promise between us, among us, about how we will be in relationship with each other. Promises are easy. We make promises all the time. We break promises all the time. But what makes a promise sacred? That part is trickier, a little more elusive. Something is sacred, it's special, set apart, worthy of respect and devotion. We give it attention and care. So in that way, our covenantal relationships are special, relationships worthy of attention and care. But there's something more. What makes our promises sacred is that they are transcendent. There is something in the promise that creates something greater than the sum of the parts, greater than each individual alone, or even the two individuals together. At their best, I think that they are tending toward the greater good. 
in the same way that we imagine the arc of the universe bending toward justice, our sacred covenantal relationships are not just relationships for the sake of themselves. They are tending toward a greater good. Our sacred promises, our covenants are purposeful. They are intentional, they are reciprocal. So covenantal relationships are faithful, full in all the senses of the word, in all the ways that we or that you, you understand this faith. Covenantal relationships are faithful relationships. We were inspired in this, in placing covenantal relationships at the heart of our mission by witnessing how other UUs are living this faith. For some, that inspiration came from Blue, Black Lives of Unitarian Universalism. Blue's mission, and even more so, our working agreements center collaboration and collective leadership. That privileges relationship over productivity. Full disclosure here, in addition to serving on the board of the UU Women's Federation, I also serve on the organizing collective board of Blue. So we were inspired by the wisdom of Blue, but we were also inspired by covenantal groups like the Lucy Stone Cooperative, an intentional living community in Boston founded by UU young adults. Our world is calling us to be creative and expansive in how we are imagining covenantal relationship, covenantal community. It's probably true that most of us here are connected to a congregational community. But congregations aren't the only way to live this faith. And they may not even be the best way that is, I know, heresy from a parish minister, but there it is. We began this reimagining work pre-COVID, but this pandemic has made clear both the necessity and also the real possibility of creating community with each other beyond distance, beyond who can physically be in the same room together. In building covenantal relationships, we want to lean into that creativity. And the last thing I'll say about our mission is that we want to not only be in covenantal relationship with each other as a board, each other as a women's federation, we think this idea of covenantal relationship is so powerful. The potential for transformation so promising that it's important for us to help foster, to help create, to help build these kinds of relationships among UU women around the country and around the world. I am so excited to be talking with you about this part of the mission because I I think it is a, a difficult thing to wrap your mind around a little bit. And as we move into the part where we're going to send people out to talk in small groups of about three or four people about this piece, covenantal relationships, could you give me an example? And I know you gave several, but I, as we move in, of a way covenantal relationships showed up in your life Mm -hmm. um, that may, as you said, be outside of your faith community. Mm -hmm. So I think the, probably <laughs> the example mm -hmm. that most people think of when we think of covenantal relationships is a marriage, right? You mm -hmm. make actual vows to each other about how you will be. Um, gosh, I didn't think I was going to say this, <laughs> but I mm -hmm. will. Um, <laughs> one of my, one of my failed <laughs> failed relationships, a failed cohabitation was one where, you know, we intended, we tried to, we sort of had an idea to do a covenant with each other and we didn't. And mm. uh, so I'm not going to say that the relationship failed because we didn't do a covenant, 
but it didn't not fail. <laughs> so the covenant. Um, but I think even even in secular relationships, place, times when we are intentional and explicit with each other about our expectations and also about what we are bringing to the relationship. And I think sometimes in my describing it, I describe it as between two people, but they don't necessarily mm -hmm. have to be between two people. They can also and often are also among many people harder mm -hmm. more challenging the more people the harder it is but also probably the more powerful they can be love that all right so our prompt what we'd like you to go out and talk about is when and how have you seen covenantal relationships show up in your world i am going to send you out into breakout rooms to talk about that i will pop that into the the chat that blasts you in the breakout room just in case you forget what the question is once you get there and we're going to give you 10 minutes to do that so i'm going to send you out we'll see you again in a little bit Enjoy that conversation. And here we go. You may have to say yes to joining that breakout room if you're not going automatically. Looks like lots of people are. If you get stuck, don't don't worry. You can just turn on your microphone and ask me for help and I can send you to your, your breakout room. All right. Does anybody need help going to there? All right. I see you, Connie. Hang on. So you should see if you go to your more, there should be a breakout room option down at the bottom. Let's see. All right, Connie, I'm sending you to a room. Betty, I'm sending you to a room. Inga, I'm sending you to a room. Rose, I'm sending you to a room. Mia, you're gone. Melissa. Reverend Laura, Diana. Eliz, there are a few people who have said they don't want to go. Oh, all right. You're welcome to say. One person has suggested a room, a quiet room for uh, people who don't want to do a breakout room. I don't know if it's possible to add another room. Um, let me look. And yes, you're welcome to just stay here. We might be doing some, um, some, uh, administrative scheming so you can, uh, quiet you us. Can absolutely you stay. Volume. Eliz, um, are you still in the middle of organizing? It looks like we still have several people here. Um, I had a question for you if you're free. It looks like everybody who wanted to go is gone. Peggy, did you want to go to a room? Just nod or I shake your head. head. Yes. Yes, you do. I was All right. I was seen, but. I had trouble with my computer. You want to go back to 17? That would be great. Thank you. All right. Hi there. I'm on a telephone, newly joined to this group. Okay. I will send, would you like to go to a breakout room? 
I oh, I'm not in a breakout room. It said joined. It said fail fail to detect your microphone. Okay, so I'm I'm joining with a uh, telephone. Can you hear me? Okay, I can. I'll yeah. send you off to a breakout room. Hang on just a second. You're going to room three. Okay. And then. All right, I think I have everybody. So go ahead. Sorry that I couldn't find Claire, but not having voice connected to the picture um, was problematic. Um, are you able to turn on captions? I think there's only captions if somebody's doing captions. Like somebody actually has to be typing. If I enable it, somebody has to type captions. No, uh, there isn't. There is a way that Zoom does it, um, but it it may be have to be enabled through your account. So it's. Let me see what I can do. Marisol commented that there are not auto captions. There are, there are options for auto captions. Okay, well, I don't know the answer, so I'm not gonna get in the middle of that conversation. I don't think that's what Marisol said. So I can turn on captions, but I can assign some a participant to type, or I can have a third party service, which I don't have available. Yeah, I think it's, um... I, I'm sorry we didn't think of it in our planning. Um, it's become yeah. really standard for UU spaces. Isabel, would you be so kind as to draft, ah, Marisol, I'm sorry about the pronunciation. Um, I now know and I will get it right in the future. Thank you for letting me know. Isabel, would you be so kind as to draft a message for the chat when everybody comes back to explain that we have done everything we can and we're sorry we didn't think of it in advance and yeah. all those things said nicely. Mm -hmm. Let me yeah. look in the settings of the thing if I can do anything different in the meeting settings. I wonder if there are new people joining us. Um, if you are welcome, we are in a time now where uh, people are in breakout rooms. Um, and so they'll be coming back in a few minutes and we'll move on with our shared program. And we have um, other time later where you can join in with those groups. Our next thing coming up in a few minutes is um, a video about the Clara Barton sisters, which I'm really excited to see. Coming up in two minutes before we bring everybody back. He lives, I got a message from someone who said, it's nice to see you and he lives together again after the sailing conference. Oh, that's Serious very overlap. nice. 
Nice overlap. I like when things are like. <laughs> All right, I am going to bring them back. And they should be coming back any moment now. All right, welcome back everybody. Back. Main thing is, you didn't want to hurt him. That's the bottom line. You All right. I think we have everybody coming back on. Thank you. I hope you had a wonderful conversation. And we're going to continue those conversations as we go along, really focusing on different parts of the new mission statement. But right now, I want to talk a little bit about this unique group of women. It has been an incredible honor and privilege to be able to talk to so many UU women in the process of preparing for this event. Uh, one group I got to talk to is three Clara Barton Sisterhood members. And the Clara Barton Sisterhood is a unique group of women who have been honored for a lifetime of service to you, you and to the greater world. They have to be 80 to be nominated. And I got to say, as I said, interview three of them. And we asked questions about their service, but also what are their hopes and insights for future generations and for right now? I know you're going to really enjoy this. My big piece um, with UUWF is the Feminist Theology Awards. They were really to start focusing on feminist theology from, of course, from the woman's perspective. It had not been happening in the Unitarian Universalist Association at the time I was there in the 80s. And we would uh, um, acknowledge the awardees at General Assembly. We'd dress up in our robes and garments and stuff and talk about the wonderful, accessible work they did. So there were some plays, there was music, there was theater, there were serious books. So those sorts of things were acknowledged and lifted up. And that's why it was so important to me. When I came to Santa Fe, I thought, no, I don't want to get all sucked into all this, you know, biz craziness business, running running things. I, I just want to take advantage of them. I want to be on the outskirts. I want to, I want to just take advantage of all the good stuff and not get involved. Uh, that didn't last more than about three months. And the first thing that they, uh, they called and asked me if I'd be secretary of the board. And I said, but, but secretaries bring coffee. I don't want to, I don't want to be a secretary. And, and he, and it was a man who, who was talking to me. He says, oh no, it's not like that at all. So uh, that was the first thing I did was be board secretary. One of the things we did was to codify who we were and what we had in mind to do and what our behaviors would be. We would, you know, be respectful listeners. We would use democratic principles. And we went through um, months of, of uh, talking to people, you know, of, of the congregation members who would come to meetings so that they would understand what we had in mind and give input. And we did role plays and all kinds of stuff. 
So uh, that was one of the, that's one of the things that has really lasted. That has been kept as a, just sort of a blueprint for how we operate, I think you'd say. So that was pretty good. I worked with the, in North Dakota in the state penitentiary on the Quaker Alternative to Violence Program. And that is absolutely a, a, something that I really saw the inherent worth of, of all people because we had sex offenders and murderers and anybody. And yet, you know, after you'd spent a, a weekend with them and working on uh, talking and listening to them, that everybody has inherent worth. So, I, and I think that absolutely, I see that how things are, goes with the Unitarian Universalist and a message of inherent worth of all people. And so that I, and that's so with family, with people you work with, with anybody. And it's so, even in politics, you know, you get somebody who you just can't stand, but I try to think, you know, they have the inherent worth. And even in the penitentiary, I mean, I knew there were people I wouldn't want out on the street, but they weren't monsters. They really, no matter what, all the awful things we did, and I always think of Brian Stevenson saying that people are not the worst thing that they've ever done are people who are behind the scenes who do some of the uh, work that is so important. And I, and I don't know, I guess you have to know yourself and how to be, if you're working at the, for the church, how do you bring out those people that, and find the right, uh, the right spot for them? I just like being in church, if you call it church. Uh. Uh, and then being with people that were kind of like me in some ways, and I like the sermons were fine, and um, I would I would leave thinking refresh. I would leave feeling refreshed and like I've got to go out and you know I got to work harder. The women that are in this congregation are, are pretty knowledgeable. A lot of them have done really interesting things. And they still want to learn. They still want more. And I think that something like our UUWF group, which is pretty big, over 100 people, I think, um, is something that needs to be um, looked after, needs to be encouraged. Hopefully. There are always women who want to do this work. Well, get involved with other UU women and ask and involve yourself and discuss. I've been in ageism groups and I've been in, I've actually been in a Marxist study group, <laughs> which was an eye opening experience since we didn't do Marxism in the home ec school when I graduated in 53. But um, so I just, I think you just have to open yourself up to difference. And I think that's what's going on right now. We're all coming out of this horrible 15 months and having, I mean, going to a restaurant outside, inside, you know, all these, we're opening again. So it's a really good moment, I think, to start exploring new ways of being, perhaps. And we have some of our Clara Barton sisters in the chat, uh, some of the three that are were featured. So show them a little love. And uh, whether you're holding up your sign or putting a little heart or some applause in the chat, as we welcome Reverend Terry Cummings to, the, to share with us. Good morning, everyone. Thank you again so much for joining us this morning at this UU Women's Federation breakfast as we begin a general assembly gathering. I wrote a prayer in honor of our new mission and theory of change 
And I'd like to share that prayer with you. But first, I'm going to invite everyone to settle into their chairs. Make sure your feet are connected to the floor. Rest your arms on your lap or some other place that's comfortable. Just take a couple of deep breaths. Focus on your breathing. Just listen to your breath without judgment. Breathe in. Breathe out. Let all the thoughts of the outside world take a break from your mind right now and take a moment to reach inside yourself. Find that holy place within you, that place within your spirit that connects to the holy place within you where you seek that mystery that has no answer, but that is always becoming, as we are all, all of us in the process of becoming, let us hear a breath within us, feel it, maybe, maybe hear our heart beating as well. Move slowly, gently. I invite you into a spirit of prayer or meditation, reflection, spirit of quiet. Spirit of life and love that moves within us and between us. We're gathered at a time of great challenge and deep uncertainty. We are seekers after truth and justice. And the road we travel is shrouded in the fog of uncertainty and fear. May our eyes be opened wide enough to see everyone, everywhere. May we all move as one towards a future where no one is left behind, where everyone is included in the breath of freedom. We know that when we are joined together by our mutual commitment to end discrimination and oppression, our love and compassion will change the world forever, for everyone. If we are brash and sassy, if we are determined and strong, if we stand up for what is right and stand with others who are standing up against patriarchy, class and white privilege, money and power, we know that those who come after us will say that we were the ones who looked in the mirror and decided to change our reflections. We were the ones who conspired with others to light the flame of freedom when it mattered most. The light of covenantal relationships. The heat of co-conspirators, the grateful exhalation of the breath of collective freedom. Spirit of life and love, may all of us who are gathered together on this Zoom call this morning feel the power that we have together to change the world and in that changing, save the world and ourselves. Holy One, may it be Ashante and Amen.
Good morning, my friends. It is wonderful to be sharing the space with all of you here this morning. I am Reverend Nancy Reed McKee. I serve the North Lake Unitarian Universalist Church in Kirkland, Washington, and I'm the vice president of the UU Women's Federation. I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember when cigarette companies could advertise on TV. But the Virginia Slims ad comes to my mind right now as they targeted the female audience by telling us, you've come a long way, baby. Well, the UUWF has come a long, long way since its founding in 1869 in the Universalist religion in 1880 in the Unitarian faith. Part of our most recent journey has been the recognition that some of the structures and identities that have served us well in the recent decades are no longer useful. And a world that is re-identifying gender is more fluid, less binary. We have to explore what it means to be a woman-identified organization. And an organization that has led women in promoting a feminist agenda in the Unitarian Universalist faith, we must now recognize how the white feminist movement has too often excluded the experience and the wisdom of black indigenous and people of color folk. And as an organization that has emerged from a value system where money infers power, we must learn to think of how our resources can be used in ways that promote equity and restitution. We are changing in many ways, and I hope you are as excited to be part of this change as I am. We long for a world where equity for some is not at the sacrifice of others. We long for a world where liberation for some is not at a cost to others. We long for a world where we fully understand the intricate web that connects each of us to the other. And where, when we get it, I mean really get it, that there is no way to create the beloved community we dream of if we don't include all, everyone, in the journey that we are on, then we will never get there. Join me. I invite you to join me as we reimagine the world, reimagine our work in creating a just and loving planet. I encourage each of you to send your donations to the link posted in the chat box. Please support the work we are doing at the UU Women's Federation for all of us, for each of us, as we seek true inclusion and equity. Blessings to you all this morning. That was lovely. And I did pop that link into the chat. And while you're contemplating, supporting this good work with a donation. I'm going to ask Nancy to tell us a little bit about the women who are featured in the next video, the Marjorie Bowen Wheatley Scholarship Program. Uh, Marjorie Bowen Wheatley was a well-loved and uh, minister and mentor who worked tirelessly to raise awareness about the need for more interracial and intercultural congregations in our UU movement. Uh, the Marjorie Bowens Wheatley uh, Scholarship was established in her memory in 2009. And um, so twice a year, we honor women and femme identifying black indigenous people of color, people who are in their pursuit of leadership in the UU faith. And, and that could be as religious leaders in music or in the ministry. So um, we help um, support them in their educational pursuit. So I am honored to introduce some of these, the history of the recipients of this award since its inception. And please enjoy the video as you contemplate a donation. This joy that I had, the world didn't give it to me. Oh. This joy that I had, the world didn't give it to me. Don't you know that? This joy that I had, the world didn't give it to me. Oh, I said the world didn't give it. 
enjoyed seeing all of you swaying along with the music and that leads me to introduce again the uh, wonderful Reverend Terry Combs. You are muted. I thought I would be automatically unmuted so I apologize everybody. Good morning again and welcome. One of the um, phrases that the members of the UU Women's Federation Board have been throwing around the last couple of years. It's inspired us, it's given us some laughs. We've talked about ways in which we can get shit done. And one of those ways we settled on is to be co-conspirators. I love the term co-conspirator. It means that we are working not just as passive allies behind the scenes, but that we are actually getting our hands dirty and putting ourselves at risk to do the work of social justice for women and women identified people everywhere. To be a, a co-conspirator reminds me of our Unitarian ancestor, William Ellery Channing, who took the word Unitarian, which was considered derogatory 200 years ago, and turned it into a badge of faith. Channing's bravery in lifting up a derogatory term and making it a part of our identity is a part of our shared history that still lives with us today. 
I doubt that 200 years from now, our denomination will be named the Unitarian Universalist Conspirator Faith. But I hope that those who come after us will honor the work we did as co-conspirators in bringing about much needed change in our denomination, our communities, and in our world. I will never forget Brittany Packnett's Ware lecture just three or four years ago, in which she pointed out the difference between an ally and an accomplice. An accomplice shows up and takes the heat with those they are fighting with and for. An ally works behind the scenes. I don't think that working behind the scenes is going to be as effective as openly conspiring with others to turn the establishment upside down. We need to be involved in good conspiracies, just as the late John Lewis inspired good trouble. I joined the UU Women's Federation Board of Trustees a couple of years ago. It was more for me than an honor to be asked to serve. It felt like validation of myself as a transgender woman, a trans woman. Being transgender for me has often felt like living in a twilight world, an in-between world with a past very different from my present. I've never made a secret of the fact that I personally identify with the, trans the traditional gender binary. It's just not the binary of the sex I was assigned at birth. I've identified with women's issues for as long as I can remember, since long before my transition. Serving on the board of the UE Women's Federation has been affirming of my own trans woman identity. It's been an opportunity to engage in work that I care about so deeply. And it's helped me to deepen and build relationships with beloved colleagues and friends, those you see on this call this morning, colleagues and friends whose place in my life has become irreplaceable. Your UU Women's Federation Board has done some deep work the past couple of years. We've shared our vulnerabilities with one another. We've asked tough questions about the purpose of the UUWF, the identity of the people it serves. And we've reached some conclusions that we would rather were not true. We've had to face the fact that the UU women's movement in general and our organization in particular in pursuing issues has mostly focused on white women and women from upper income and educational backgrounds. It's left way too many people behind, women of color especially. And we've also realized that we are trailing behind those who have blazed the trail in important areas of work involving women's issues. You see, you, we, you, you women have suffered from the same problems of white and class privilege as the broader society has suffered from, as well as the problems of privilege that has afflicted our Unitarian faith and institutions. This has been something of a reckoning for me personally, because I'm a white person with a professional education and career background that carried full scale male privilege. And these are privileges that you can't shed like a skin. And so I've been challenged to find ways in which I can use the privilege I'm accustomed to wearing to bring about change. And more than ever in my work as a UU minister, I see myself in the future working 
at the intersection of race, gender, and class privilege to undo systemic and cultural racism, class privilege, and gender oppression. This is in keeping with the new mission and theory of change that we on the UUFWF board have been working on the past couple of years. You see, I speak the language of whiteness. I speak the language of male. And I speak the language of class privilege. These skills are well suited to the work of being a co-conspirator. I'm not afraid of being branded as a conspirator at all. Bring it on. If the UU women's movement is going to stop leaving people behind, and if we are to have any chance of catching up to those who are way ahead of us, we're going to have to change the way we do things. All of us on the UU Women's Federation Board understand that to be true. Being co-conspirators with everyone who is working to undo racism, class and gender inequities is a part of that change. Ours is a conspiracy of truth tellers and seekers. Ours is a conspiracy of people who get shit done. Oh, you're getting lots of love uh, for that very uh, inspirational message. This is hard work, both for you as the board, but also individually. And you talked a little bit about that. And we're going to send people off to talk about the feelings that are invoked by this. Why do you think it is so hard for us necessarily to talk about issues of being allies and co-conspirators? Uh, well, I think for me, Elise, it, 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 it means taking responsibility for the fact that I have been complicit in injustice and unfairness and oppression, um, maybe unwittingly, but definitely a part of a system that is unfair and it's made me feel angry and frustrated. And I think that for me personally, uh, on the one hand, I, as I just said, I enjoyed all of the privileges of whiteness and maleness and class. But as a trans woman, I've seen, um, I've been the, the victim of, of microaggressions, um, downright bigotry, and, and I'm watching the, um, the, the anti-trans legislation mm. go to across the states. And I, I feel like I really more than anyone need to cross the line and, and work for change because it, it's almost a way of kind of cleansing myself mm. Um, mm -hmm. and, and hel helping to cleanse the world. Like, I wouldn't say that I feel dirty, but I definitely feel definitely feel that I've been that I've been affected by those privileges and I don't want to live that way anymore. Thank you for that. Here is our prompt. We'd like you to discuss what feelings are evoked by talking about co-conspirator and ally issues. I'm going to send you off. We'll send you a little message uh, when it's time to come back. See you soon. All right, and again, you may need to accept that invitation in order to go back into your breakout room. There they go. We have quite a few people who are um, unassigned. If you aren't getting an invitation to go in, just let me know and I can send you to a breakout room. I switched devices. And so that could be why I'm not getting a... Lisa, do you remember what room you were in? No, I was on my phone. Um, All right, well... Parked in my car at the I'm time. Gonna send, 
<laughs> All right, I'm going to send you off to one then. Thank you. And I'm You're Molly. Welcome. I got here late, so wherever there's room. All right. I will send you someplace. I apologize. I got here late. I just heard the end of that. I'm inspired. Oh, yeah, oh, that was yeah, that no. was pretty wonderful. Uh, uh, anybody else? Uh, uh, Louise, Louise, I'm also a late cover. Okay. That's good because we had a couple of people leave to go to the first timers. So that works out. Um, Janet, Janet wants to go. Yes. I was in 30. There was no one else there. So I don't know if they. Oh, no. <laughs> Let me move. You can send you. me back there. Maybe they're there. But I waited. I'll send you to do a different room. Here you go. Okay. Um, anybody else want to go to a room? All right. Ladies, I have to apologize. There is a uh, error on the uh, show flow where I only counted a minute for our table talks. So this is why we're running a little behind. And we didn't catch it. Yeah, data's making the face. The Oh, oh, sugar face. Um, so we can. Um, it's reduce... just this one, though, right? No, sure is not. I didn't do it on the front, first one either. But you did it on the last one. Yeah, good for me. Got it right eventually. Got it right eventually. All right, um, so we're running late. We told yeah. people. We told people till quarter two. Perfect. So we have then I think we'll just. Little. We'll, we'll make that um, pretty close to right. Okay. Um, uh, Elise? Elise? Yes. Um, Elise. Elise, I, I went to breakout room 12, and I think I was the yes. only person. Okay. I um, came back. Let... <laughs> Ingrid's trying to say something. You're muted, Ingrid. Oh. Ingrid, you should unmute. So Molly, let's move you into some a place where there are people. <laughs> there you go. I'm sending you to room 10. All right, thank you. Who else? You, Ingrid's trying to very well. Ingrid, maybe you can oh. put it in the chat. Ingrid, can you also, put it? Ingrid, did you want to go to a room that has people in it? Yes, I will send you the same <laughs> one I just sent Molly to. And Ingrid, check and see if you have a uh, hearing. You don't have um, earphones plugged in, do you? You may need to unplug them again if, that, if you can't hear right. All right. Something happened. I lost everything. Oh, there, there you go. Is. I know, but I lost the whole thing. I see just a couple of people. I can't even see. I, I lost the whole site. I don't know what happened here. Oh, no. Um, yeah, it's just I see four people and I, I don't know what happened. I don't know whether it was my computer or I don't know what happened here. Something happened. So um, I'll just I'll just hang on. I'll just hang on until we get maybe something. Maybe I'll get back eventually. Yeah. I don't know. So if I do right this, now. do you see me bigger? I don't see. I see four people. I see Reverend Kimberly. I see Reverend Nancy Reed. I see Dana Roth and myself. And I can't do anything else. Something happened with my with that whole website. Hmm. hmm. And I do you want to go out and come? Yeah, let me try to totally go out and try to lock in. Let's see what happens. Yeah. That's what I'm gonna do. That works. Okay. I'm bad. We are nine. Still not, I'm still here. <laughs> um still here. I don't know what happened. I think I have to turn off my whole computer. Oh, no. um, 
it's really weird. What? Oh, wait a minute. Now I wait, see. Ingrid. What do you see on your? What do you? Uh, so you see the I, four of us. What else do you see? Uh, and now I have, and that's basically. Wait a minute. Uh, and that's all I see. Oh, wait a minute. Let's see. You don't see you any know. menus or? No. Well, I see. What if you right press now. escape? Okay. I cannot even escape. I can leave. Let's like see what happens. On your happens keyboard, when, when your keyboard, can you press escape? Oh yeah, I think. Wait a minute. Leaving? Hold on. View. Yeah. So if you go gallery. to speaker ah, view, you I'm make back. it. I'm back. Yay! <laughs> this is really weird. Okay, I'm back, but maybe I'll just hang on and wait until the um, everybody comes back. Yeah. It's really weird. Because we're going to be bringing them back in a few anyway. Yeah. So I'll just hang out and uh, <laughs> maybe I could talk to Robert Kimberly. <laughs> mm -hmm. Maybe I could talk to my my Reverend Kimberly. <laughs> Escape is, is my new alternative to like turning everything off and back on again. I'm like, well, let me just, I mean, I want to escape a lot of times. So, <laughs> well, I, 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 right? Listen, I had no intention to escaping. I don't know what all of a sudden everything was gone. And so, I don't know. Well, the world of technology, what can I say? There you go. So I'll just hang out and wait. Maybe I'll make myself a cup of coffee and come back. How's that? Oh, smart plan. That's what I'm going to do. Okay. So long until, until I'm ready. I think I had two folks from my congregation here this morning. Ingrid and Cindy. Nice. Which is so cool. All right, I'm going to close them up. About 20 seconds till everybody comes shooting back in. I love the shooting back in part. It but, is. You know, it's kind of fun. It always reminds me of Star Trek. <laughs> Absolutely. Just welcome back, everybody. I hope you had a great conversation. Welcome back. There's never enough time. I know, I know, but stay tuned. There may be a way to continue these conversations. I'm just saying, don't fret. There, uh, I'm glad that you're having great conversations. We know that the time is short, but here is what many of you have been waiting for. I had the privilege of interviewing Cameron Rowling. Oh my goodness. Uh, such a rich and educational and inspirational conversation. We talked for an hour and a half. I had to trim that down to about 15 minutes of sheer brilliance, but I will tell you it is one of the most difficult things I've done recently because everything she says is pretty darn brilliant and inspirational. 
you won't hear my voice except for a couple of laughs on it because I wanted to save every moment just for her. Please enjoy. Mm -hmm. That when I came to Unitarian Universalism as a black woman, I was very excited to read literature like um, Mark Morrison reads Black Pioneers in a White Denomination. And um, if you're familiar with it, he profiles um, um, three, maybe four of the first black male ministers. Um, that were um, fellowship as U Unitarian um, ministers. I think they were all Unitarian. The point is, it was a, it's a very um, amazing book. And what I was left with is, hmm, so who are the women? Because I was new and I wanted to know them. So, so the book exposed me to the males, black males, and I wanted to know who the black females were that were um, amazing in their own right. And um, I looked around. I did a few years later find a book standing before us, um, Reverend Dorothy May Emerson. And I actually have a, um, an essay in there, but the point is, out of, I think, almost 40 essays, or maybe even more, I think there were three essays about Black women. So I had begun this search and begun to wonder where the scholarship was, where the literature was. And here I am, that was 1992. 91, 92, and a few years ago, maybe around oh, 2005, I was already start continuing that search, but I had not realized that I was gonna have to be the one to write the book. Uh -huh. um, because, I looked around and it still hadn't been written. And that's when I finally figured it out. Oh, you're going to have to write it. So interestingly enough, the book that's coming out, it's an anthology on the presence of Black Unitarian Universalists, clergy women. I hadn't started out to write that. But in my research about Black women, I happened to notice there was absolutely nothing on black clergy women. And I thought, okay, I have to make a slight little adjustment <laughs> in my research focus, which is what I did. And so that anthology hopefully will be out the end of the year. Wow, how exciting. But I continued to do the research on um, black UU women and realized two things. Number one, another discovery, where are Black you, you girls? If there was little or no research on Black you, you women, there was nothing I could find on you, you girls. And so I began to talk about Black you, you women and girls, and also try to qualify that when I was saying women, I was saying transgendered, I was saying, um, I'm trying to remember all of the, all of the different categories, non-binary, um, so on and so forth, so that folks understood my abbreviated woman did not exclude any of those identities. Um, and that also as a woman in her 70s that I am growing in my understanding and awareness. Um, and so I was a little late coming to the recognition of those identities, just like I think Unitarian Universalism has been a little late coming into an awareness that we've got some gaps in the narrative. If we're going to tell the story of Unitarian Universalist women, it has to include you, you women of color. Um, Black, Indigenous, people of color women. 
And so that's what I've been involved in doing. So one, in, in addition to the grant that I've received from the Women's Federation, and I wanna say that the Women's Federation represented one of my first, if you will, sponsors. Mm -hmm. I got some of my very, my very first and early grants from the Women's Federation. They were small, but nevertheless, they motivated me to really continue to work. And it also was an affirmation that I knew it was important, but the grant confirmed what I already knew. Um, so it was nice to have that confirmation. But I've also recently gotten a $25,000 grant from the Fund for Theological Education to create a syllabus that really reflects Unitarian and Universalist and Unitarian Universalist women's history. Mm -hmm. So that it is really a more accurate depiction of you Unitarian and Universalist women. Um, I'm trying to remember what year, 2007, um, I decided I, I was already in seminary part-time and it was taking so long. I think I'd already been att attending, um, they call it the uh, Modified Residency Program at Meadville Lombard Theological School. About, I'd been in it about three years and it's like, I was already in my, was I in my fifties at that point? It's like, I'll be an old woman by the time I get through seminary. So in 2007, I moved to, um, to Chicago and started the program. But meanwhile, I had been doing all this writing and research. And so being a student, you have to write papers constantly. Every opportunity I could get, I would write about Black UU women. I would write about Black UUs because I was wanting to know this information. I was wanting to become familiar with these historic personalities and, and, and to understand their journey and how mm -hmm. it paralleled, if it in fact did, my own. And I'm, I'm telling you this because by then, I had all of these papers that I had written, short papers, long papers, even if the instructor said 10 to 15 pages, I might write a 30 page paper because I wasn't writing it for the instructor. I was writing because I had a vision of what I needed to learn, what I needed to understand. And if it took me 30 pages, that's what I was going to do. Um, rather than the 15. So I feel, looking back, I feel sorry for some of my instructors because I really, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I really made them work. But um, I, I hope that what they saw in my papers was that I was inspired by the course. I was inspired by their teaching and their knowledge and that I was applying it in a very practical way, not a paper that I'd put on the shelf or a paper that I would discard because the, his, the, the, the point of the website, I started thinking about all of these papers and wondering what I would do with them and what others were doing with theirs. And I realized we need a website. Black union women and girls need a website so that not only that kind of scholarship and information can be gathered in one place, but it also can invite others and inspire others to do similar things, to write and to think about and to discuss the journey that Black UU women and girls have experienced in Unitarian Universalism. So that's how the website idea was conceived. And since that time, I've placed some of my sermons on. I've invited others to place theirs on. I'm inviting essays and looking for information that I'm um, placing on, on the website. And um, it's, it's, yes, yes. Um, I have to give a shout out to um, Jan Carpenter Tucker. She is a Unitarian Universalist woman who is in business and she has a, um, 
it's like a graphics and um, website design business. Interestingly enough, she was one of the very first Black women that I interviewed many, many years ago. I can't even remember how I wound up getting back in touch with her and discovered that she had this business and I was looking for a web developer. It's like, it was perfect. It was perfect. So we're working on the website and are just very excited about um, going public with it. One of the things that I hadn't mentioned is that my friend Ann Olson was on the board of the Women's Federation and had been on for many years. And she was about ready to come off. And she mentioned it to me and said, I think that y'all would be a good match for each other. Um, I get a call one evening from Reverend Marjorie Bowens Wheatley. Uh, I'm calling her name and getting emotional because she, she is no longer with us. She has joined the ancestors, but her call that night, see, had I not been well-read, I wouldn't have known who she was. I knew immediately when she said her name, who she was, and I knew that this was an honor. She was calling to recruit me to the Women's Federation Board. Um, of course, I said yes. You don't say no to Marjorie Bowens Wheatley. Uh, I said yes, and that began that journey with the Women's Federation and understanding how women fit into the larger context of Unitarian Universalism and how we impact the narrative about Unitarian Universalism. And the Women's Federation to a great extent has been able to influence the narrative by the work that they do. If I simply say the Charlotte GA, everyone will know what year that was, but this, the planning committee sent out an invite. They, they, they were planning a Thomas Jefferson ball and they invited people to come and um, um, what did they call that? Um, costume dress for the era. Well, black people got it immediately. It's like, uh, do you really wanna do that? The reason I'm telling the story is because in the Women's Federation board meeting, we devoted a great amount of time to discussion about it. And a letter was composed and sent to the planning committee. The planning committee can never say they were not forewarned. We were not the only ones that, that um, informed them this is not a good idea. But the point is, if that history isn't captured, no one will know that the Women's Federation was at the forefront of raising that issue and saying, this is not acceptable. Um, but again, that's the importance of being able to capture your history so that those that come behind you will know who you've been, what you've stood for, um, and, and the vision that has been held, not just recently, but there's a long history and, and whose shoulders are we standing on? Those women that sat around that table and discussed that and said, we're not having this. No, we are writing to this planning committee and letting them know that this is not happening. And I hope someplace in the archives that letter exists. One more story, uh, Yvonne, Reverend Dr. Yvonne Sayon, first Black woman ordained and fellowshiped um, as a Unitarian Universalist minister. I had read some of her history and information, but until I read um, Mark Morrison Reed's one of his most recent anthologies, uh, it'll uh, missed opportunities. In this essay, Reverend Dr. Yvonne Sayon talks about being in search for 10 years. I was in search once for a year. It was the year from hell. I cannot even imagine 10 years. Had she not written that, I could not appreciate 
what she experienced as the first black woman ordained in fellowship. Our, you, your congregations were not ready for her. But how would I know that if she didn't tell her story? I have the utmost respect for her understanding that now. I, I just can't even comprehend 10 years in search. And she eventually had to return to academia. Um, but it really, it really impacted me because it gave me a deeper understanding of what had transpired before I came on the scene because I didn't have the kinds of trials and tribulations and barriers and obstacles that she experienced. Why? Because she broke some of that down. She made the difference. And we need to know that. We needed to know her story. And I'm so glad she told it. I think all of us are so glad that Kiyama told her story. There is so much more on that video. I'm gonna provide that to her so she has it for her website, uh, building that history of UU women. We're gonna move forward to talk about collective liberation and welcome back, Isabel Call. Wow, I'm um, filling up with with all this energy, and um, thank you, Reverend Kiyama. Wow, um, just a, a lot of good. Um, yeah, I'm a little bit overwhelmed by all the conversation, um, and I am here to talk about collective liberation. I think that um, sort of immersing in, um, in each other is a part of that process, collective liberation. Um, I wanted to just talk about this term. Um, to me, collective, um, collective is this organic um, quality, uh, like a bird's migrating in a V or a forest. Um, sharing resources and information. Collectivity is not a fixed structure like an institution. It's a community of people being responsive to each other and responsive to the group conscience. It's covenantal. Um, as Kimberly was sharing earlier, uh, a collective is greater than the sum of our parts. Um, it's individuals and faithful relationships. And and liberation is also organic. Um, it's this organic freedom to be fully human. And um, women have held the wisdom um, that being fully human is to be caring for ourselves um, and for each other. And so collective liberation is this freedom to be ourselves together. Collective liberation is collective action and collective reflection. It's, it's organic. It's stability within what is true and movement toward what is needed. Um, so I'm, I'm really inspired in my understanding of collective liberation. Um, by the idea of community of communities that I learned from Paula Cole Jones. Um, this idea that to be a collective, we are, we're sort of a fractal. We're, we're people within communities, within communities. Uh, uh, Venn diagram, um, multidimensional, we've, we are um, circles within circles, but we're also overlapping circles, uh, you know, we have intersectionality. I find myself in the community of UU women, in the community of UU ministers, in the community of people with disabilities, in so many more communities. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's this fractal. And my practice, um, the way that I engage in collective liberation, my understanding is to start with centering the needs of my body and soul um, 
as a way to learn how to center the needs and insights of the most vulnerable people within my closest communities. And that's what makes me strong as an individual and it's what makes us strong um, as a community. And then from that place of integrity, we're able to circle around the most vulnerable nearby communities, resourcing them and listening for their insights. And so I've been feeling that this morning, I've been feeling that, that self-advocacy in the chat um, and the advocacy for others, for people who are needing captioning so that they can fully be present with us, um, for people who want a space, um, for other people, for other Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Um, this is the kind of care for themselves I see those people taking and the kind of care that I want the UWF to offer. Um, and so we're listening and doing what we can to learn how to circle around. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there and um, see where Eliz will take us next. Well, uh, I love all of that. In looking at the chat, there's a lot of people who are very inspired by, by what we've heard so far. And interviewing the women that I did, there is this UU woman calling, is that the right word, to serve uh, within the faith community, in the community larger. But that sounds like a daunting thing. Not all of us can be the women that we've seen profile today. What's one small part of collective liberation that you can play? And I guess that's gonna be our prompt, but I, I'd like to ask you, what's your small part? Mm. Yeah, yeah, I've, I, I am, my small part, for myself is building a daily practice um, of self-care that, that balances, like what do I need in this body, which includes deepening relationship with, especially women in my life, one-on-one -on -one relationship and then community connection. And so I'm um, finding a way in my life so that every day or every two days I'm getting those three pieces listening mm. to myself, deepening relationship with another person and connecting to the community near me. And then when I'm with my community, like the WF Ford, how are we, how are we building our understanding of our connection to the other communities? So yeah, I'm starting with a daily practice. That's my small part. I, I like that. So we're going to send you off to talk about that prompt. Uh, oops, that's not the right one. There it is. Uh, what is your small part of working towards collective liberation? We're going to go out for just five minutes. I know it's short, but we want to be respectful of our time. We'll see you in a few. All right. Hopefully everybody gets to go who wants to go this time. Here we go. All right. That was me doing math in case anybody, oh, I didn't have my camera on, so you couldn't see me counting on my fingers to figure out when I need to send the broadcast to remind people that we were coming back. All right. Um, Eliz, there's a note in the chat from someone who just had one, had no one else in her room. Uh, that was me. 
Looks like a couple of me's. Um, ah. So room 22 asked for help. Can you do that one? And I will assign um, a chance. Uh, so um, forgive me. I'm not, oh, I don't know how to well, say you one person. Okay. Um, can you tell me what rooms you were in and I'll go find you. I was in room 26. 26. There you are. Let us move you. All right, I'll move you into room two. Who else needs to be moved? Anybody? Melissa in 22. Oh, she's in there. All right. Thank you, Claire. All right. Thank you for managing that, Dana. Oh, you're muted. Can you send her directly to another room? Uh, from room 22, I see. Yeah, just can. move her to somewhere else. Yep. Cool. And room 19 asks for same. I will move room 19 person to 21. Thank you. Um, so I, here's something to, for us to keep in mind, Dana, is when you have this many people on a, on a meeting, it is very hard to find the presenters. Ah, ah, so I, sh I should have made everybody co-hosts. That would have been easier, I think. I... Lots of lessons learned. There always is. There always is, no matter how many times we do this. Always learn There's something. always new things. Um, the closed captioning thing. Uh, that one's, that one's gonna, I'm gonna lose sleep over that one. Um, we will figure out the answer. I can closed caption the um, video. Yeah, we're definitely gonna close caption the video for sure. That may take a moment. Do we need to find someone to do that for us? Is that a service we need or? Um, there are probably people who are faster at it. I mean, there, there's third party plugins that you can get to do it um, and then you go fix it. Um, All right. Let's do a you little I, investigation and figure it out. I'll do it too. We'll figure it out. Yeah. All right. Here we go. They're coming back. They're coming back. It's Star Trek. <laughs> See, there's Star Trek, or it's that little kid from Willy Wonka. Mike T. Mm. Just broke up into all the little bits and went whoosh and then was a tiny little tiny little guy yes so if somebody was just coming in when i was making that noise they might be very confused about which just happened <laughs> <laughs> new feature on zoom it makes a noise for you when you come back mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all right we have about 20 seconds before everybody comes filtering back in I'm looking forward to getting shit done next year. <laughs> right? Right? Oh, here they all come.
All right. Welcome back, everyone. This has been just a lovely morning, and I'm welcoming now Ann Weisner to uh, close us off. But before we do that, I'll... one of the things that people have been saying in the chat and uh, is about continuing this conversation. I'm pretty excited about the way you all have figured out how to allow that to happen. Tell us a little bit about Mighty Yeah, Mighty. yeah, um, yes, thank you. I'm, I'm excited about it too. What we've done is put together um, a place for us all to continue to talk, um, basically virtually, um, by mm -hmm. joining what's uh, a platform called Mighty Networks. And I believe that we are going to drop the link in the chat um, so that you can join that spot. It is a private um, space. So the only people who get the link from us can join. And right now um, it has some topics that are focused on the same questions that we've been talking about today in our table talk. So we're really excited about staying in touch and, and using it as a tool for you all to continue to be involved in the work and teach us um, and join us. And so um, just watch that chat and we'll also include the link um, when we send out follow-up communication. So Really excited about that. Hope you'll jump on and contribute. It's it's a it takes a little getting used to. So just go on and kind of look around, but know that um, it's it's easy once you kind of get the hang of it. And it's easy um, to sign up. It, mm -hmm. it took I don't know that it even took me a minute. Uh, yeah. If you're already on Facebook, you just say log in with Facebook and you're good to go. So. Mm -hmm. Don't hesitate. I, I think that's going to be a wonderful place. So I'm going to hand it off to you to close us out. Great. Well, we'd like to end today um, with a quote from Audre Lorde, The Uses of Anger. And I'm, I'm just going to read it to you and then wrap us up. Um, starting the quote, for women raised to fear, too often anger threatens annihilation. In the male construct of brute force, we were taught that our lives depended upon the goodwill of patriarchal power. The anger of others was to be avoided at all costs because there was nothing to be learned from it but pain, a judgment that we had been bad girls, come up lacking, not done what we were supposed to do. And if we accept our powerlessness, then of course any anger can destroy us. But the strength of women lies in recognizing differences between us as creative, and in standing to those distortions which we inherited without blame, but which are now ours to alter. The angers of women can transform difference through insight into power. For anger between peers births change, not destruction. And the discomfort and sense of loss it often causes is not fatal, but a sign of growth. I am a lesbian woman of color whose children eat regularly because I work in a university. If their full bellies make me fail to recognize my commonality with a woman of color whose children do not eat because she cannot find work or who has no children because her insides are rotted from home abortions and sterilization. If I fail to recognize the lesbian who chooses not to have children, the woman who remains closeted because her homophobic community is her only life support. The woman who chooses silence instead of another death. The woman who's terrified lest my anger trigger the explosion of hers. If I fail to recognize them as other faces of myself, then I'm contributing not only to each of their oppressions, but also to my own. And the anger which stands between us then must be used for clarity and mutual empowerment, not for evasion by guilt or for further separation. I am not free while any woman is unfree, even when her shackles are very different from my own. And I'm not free as long as one person of color remains chained. Nor is any one of you. End quote. So come with us, learn with us, pursue freedom with us, get angry with us. You can start by joining Mighty Networks. 
And there we can continue these conversations and start a whole lot more and continue to build these relationships and our collective capacity for useful anger and liberating action. So thank you for joining us today. And we look forward to conspiring with you in the months and years to come. Thank you, everybody. Thank mm -hmm. you.